set. Hut, hut. As the hills of West Virginia resound with the sound of Golden Blue football. Almost heaven, West Virginia. Now let's bring on the Mountaineers. Goes around the back to 15 to 10 to 5. A touchdown with Virginia. He did it. He did it. Patrick White. Touchdown, Tay Vaughn Austin. But Don Nealon's Mountaineers enjoy walking in where angels fear to tread. I think you think that these guys are going to fall over dead for, for you. Well, I got news for you. They're going to punch you right in the mouth. It's Mountaineer pride. Nothing cheap, nothing dirty, but West Virginia football. Right? West Virginia football. We've no doubt tonight they shouldn't have played the old Golden Blue. Not this night. They've done it. They've done it. A perfect season. And the Mountaineers, for the first time in history, undefeated and untied. Don Nealon. And his Mountaineers, for the second time, have finished a regular season with an unblemished mark. Ain't no stopping the Golden Blue. And now recorded from the CRW Studios in Almost Heaven, West Virginia. It's the Country Roads webcast with your host, Jordan Cruz. What's going on, Mountaineer Nation? Welcome back into the Country Roads webcast. Here to talk about the first game of the West Virginia's 2024 football season. Didn't end the way we hoped, but we're still here to provide, you know, the review and reaction as it will be all season long, starting here with episode 191 here in season seven. And joining me to help me talk about it and discuss it, my two great co-hosts, we've got Bradley. What up, what up, what up? And Steven. What's going on, everybody? All right, gentlemen. So West Virginia comes out, lays a dud in the first game of the season, unfortunately falls 34-12 to to Penn State, starting the season 0-1 for the fourth consecutive year here at WVU. Not where we wanted to be, not the performance that we wanted to see, uh, but we're going to kind of give our thoughts on it, then we'll dive into the numbers a little bit and take some uh, look at some scores around the Big 12 to wrap up the show. So I guess, gentlemen, We can start here, um, you know, going into this game. I think we all were kind of feeling pretty good, especially uh, Stephen and I kind of, you know, picked the victory. Brad, a little bit more uh, realistic, I guess we can say now in hindsight. But what do you guys think? At some point in time, so I I was not right about that. I said it was going to be a comeback. but Yeah, Brad was wrong too. (laughs) I'm going to show it on the stats at the end of the year, though. Yeah, no, seriously. And I think that's where it kind of comes to is I felt – just my my perspective as a fan when I walked into it, I I felt like I've definitely seen Morgantown more hype than what I saw yesterday. Like I feel like when we were talking yeah. about it like a group last week, right? We were talking about how crazy it was. You're comparing it to the LSU game of the past, right? Pat McAfee looked crazy on Friday. That was like fun. You know, it looked like people had a good time there. But I would say that there was more people there than the big new kickoff. I think so. Like too. I showed up there. I wanted to go see what it looked like, and you know, um, it was like almost about to be ten a.m. when they were kicking off. So I walked up there. I was like, just wanted to see how crazy it was getting up there, and then I found myself almost at the front row because there was hardly anybody up there. You know, I was like, you know, a few people back, and they were kind of starting to push people in. But even when I left, like once uh, MGK came on, it was still not a lot of people up there. So like, if it was game day, like that would have been slam pack. So I don't know what it was from the very jump of the day. I was just like. There's no energy. It, 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 I didn't feel it. You know what I mean? And, like, I I can't tell you why. But, like, even, like, when I feel like I got off the PRT and, like, looked out at the blue lot, I was like, it's not active down there. I was like, you know, it's kind of – I don't know. It just felt different. I, I don't know if that was just me. Everybody else can share their experiences. But, like, I just, like, didn't feel that energy from the jump. No, I agree with you. I'll go ahead and, and share my thoughts on that because I, sh- I said that multiple times yesterday – as as hyped up as the game was as you know the biggest home opener and since 98 and you know how much we heard through the media how the the fans need to show up and be supportive and be a be a factor in this game and not get deflated after one or even two or a couple things happen i mean that's exactly what happened i mean as soon as the first play that penn state had that they you know they got a big uh chunk of yardage just deflated there was even a couple um, a couple of Penn State fans in front of of me and my grandfather, <laughs> and they 
the our entire section was sitting down and they were you know the entire time like turned around they're like why aren't you guys standing up you know they were saying it yeah i couldn't get anybody around me to stand up you know it's like third down trying to get loud and crazy and everybody's just you know like sitting nonchalantly and i'm like what when has this become the thing you know i thought about it i was like i know that it's it felt like it was a hundred and some degrees yeah, it, it was might hot. very well oh could have been close to that because i know in on, that uh, Friday, whenever we got up to west and it was yeah. around 100 degrees so it's quite possible that it was that hot but yeah i mean if you're coming to the game i mean we got to be we got to be up and we got to be effective and i don't know what could have been the issue but on so many levels i was so disappointed and you know we'll get to the team in just a second but just talking about the fans i was so disappointed in in how that turned out because on friday you're right brad i think that it was of i I thought that they did a phenomenal job on pat mcafee's show they they turned out in great numbers they filled up the you know whatever you want to call it right there at the life sciences building where that you know grass section is they filled that entire section up and i thought they did a great job of you know giving a positive image of wvu students i guess you could say yeah a few few bleeped out words I've never been to game day personally, so I don't know what to compare it to as because me and Cruz were standing there. Me, him, and my papa were standing there, big noon kickoff right behind. I think it, the bear is what I call right it. Right behind the bear, yeah. Standing right behind him, and you're right. It did seem like it was very thin, but I thought it was just because it was right up, you know, people were leaving because the show was about to end and the kickoff was about to happen. That's why I thought that there was, wasn't that many people. I didn't realize that it was like that the entire time. Yeah, I was there uh, right at the very start of it, and it was just kind of. Hmm. But I don't know. I don't know if it was the rain delay. I don't know if it was the, even before the rain delay. They felt it felt very flat well, and very dull. I felt like a big chunk of it came from the heat. Like as as like I was sitting there, I was like, "Yeah, this like this." And I tweeted it out at the same time because I was like, "This game being at noon is a disservice to football." I'm like because the fans yeah, right. are out here dying in the heat, which you know people play on Texas. Like we're not anything special, you know what I mean? Which I don't understand. I don't. I don't get the whole, the whole premise of see like college game day. You can have college game day, but it doesn't affect the timing of your game. It can kick off at noon that day. Sometimes it, those games kick off at seven at night. It just three thirty in the day. It, you know, whenever they can, they want to schedule that prime time matchup is when they do those for ESPN and game day. But then Frox, with big noon kickoff, literally in the name, you have to kick it off at noon. And I just don't <laughs> I just don't understand logistically why you would why you would do that. Because in the future, it's gonna make people not want to sign with your network. Because then you're hindering well, I mean, in a way, you know, without a doubt, like that play the fact, I mean you got you got our starting left tackles Absolutely. cramping up all like to the point where his whole body can't function. You got, you know, slippery arms, everybody's fumbling and affected both teams. But to me, I was just like, man, this is not enjoyable football right now. Not to like watch, not to play. Like I that was enjoyable for nobody at twelve o'clock that day. Well, other than Michael Hayes, I can't really tell you a positive thing from the football game from a West Virginia football perspective. Well, I think I think uh, Josiah Trotter had a pretty good game, and Wyatt Milam before he before he went out. But other, that's probably the one player on defense, one player on offense that stood out to me overall. Yeah, Michael Hayes, best player uh, for WVU on Saturday, which you know not exactly the way that we wanted it to play out for sure. But I'm with you guys. I agree. The energy just didn't seem like it was there because you know those other games that you know Brad mentioned, you know the LSU game in 2011, you know some other ones and you know, the past decade or so, when you walked into that stadium, you could just feel like electric electricity, you know, you felt just a certain vibe and you didn't really feel that one in this. And I don't know, like you said, maybe the heat played a part in it, but I think it seemed like a lot of the energy was there in the lead up to the game. But then when it came around to have that energy for the game itself, it, it had dissipated by that point or something. I don't know, but it definitely yeah, didn't feel that energetic to me, but play on the field, obviously, you know, I think in a lot of ways, uh, the weather kind of mirrored how the day went for us as fans, right? You know, it was bright and sunny early on, got good vibes about what could happen in the game, what could happen in the season. And as the game wore on and as our, you know, hopes dropped, the weather, you know, changed and got dreary as well, you know, kind of mirrored our feelings as fans, I think, throughout that game, unfortunately, with the way that things played out. So, you know, I guess one of the main questions I want to ask you guys is, did we – Underhype Penn State, or did we overhype West Virginia, or do you guys think it was a little bit of both? 
Uh, I'll go ahead and answer that. The first one. I think we underhyped Penn State. Uh, I I truly believe West Virginia is going to be still be a pretty good football team this year. Whether we're you know whether our predictions in the season prediction roundtable are still accurate, I don't know because the team didn't even fight yet <laughs> yesterday. I mean, and that was that's what really disappointed me was it just they showed no fight, no tenacity uh, for a veteran group. You know, if this was a bunch of sophomores and freshmen, juniors, I'd be like, you know, we, we, you know, there's still time, but no, this is, that's unacceptable to me. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but I think that it was just Penn State. Penn State was just a very, very good football team. I mean, they potentially, they might not just make the playoff. They might win the whole daggone thing this year. They might play Georgia in the national championship. I was impressed as well. That might be an early prediction of mine. Uh, but I was truly impressed. Uh, Drew Aller, very, very underrated, uh, especially as a as a scrambler and a you know improviser that can you know make plays up the middle because he made our defensive line look absolutely silly multiple times, uh, you know, and change the direction. I remember one time he even scrambled out to the right, got stuff there, so he scrambled out to the left and had nothing but green in front of him for about thirty or forty yards. So I mean. He was impressive. Nick Singleton was was impressive. They had a lot of guys. I'm not going to sit here and list all of them. Uh, but West Virginia didn't do things to to help themselves. They made them look a lot better, but they are a really good football team. Yeah, I was impressed by them as well. I think Andy Nicky as their offensive coordinator, really makes them super dangerous offensively, makes them way more explosive than they were previously. And you pair that with – what was already, you know, a great Penn State defense. We talked about it in the preview for the game, you know, top five in the country in pretty much every category last year, and they looked just as good this year, if not better, especially in the trenches on the both sides of the ball. That's what kind of I was disappointed with overall from the game is just how much Penn State dominated us in the trenches, both on offense and defense. That's what really kind of controlled this thing, I think, you know, from the get-go pretty much. So, I, yeah, I found Penn State impressive, uh, maybe undervalued them a little bit. I don't know if we overhyped West Virginia necessarily, but they certainly didn't perform up to the way that I expected them to in this game. I'm thinking that hopefully moving forward, that will change. Like Steven said, I still have uh, some faith and belief in this club. A lot can change, you know, following week one. And, you know, week one in college football is always a crapshoot. You don't have, you know, any preseason games or anything like that. You never really know how you're going to come out and play. And sometimes it takes that first game to be able to see, okay, this is a weakness for us. We need to make adjustments here, and then you can get a lot better as the season progresses. So, you know, I think West Virginia still can be a good football team. Much like Garrett Green said in his post game, all their goals are still in front of them. You know, they just got to turn things around by the time Big 12 conference play starts. But I definitely think Penn State's better than I expected them to be, and West Virginia didn't play as good as I thought that they would. Yeah, absolutely. And see, for me personally, I think that it's – I think it's a little bit of both. I think that definitely Penn State looked dominant. Those are some hella good football players. Like those guys are out there playing good ball, catching like solid catches. Wide receivers getting open. They knew what they were doing. They had a down pat. Like that looked like like a, a dialed in team. Like they looked absolutely ready to go out there and make it their own. And but I, I would say I feel like when it comes to overhype in West Virginia, I feel like it definitely has happened some because like. And I feel like I brought this up in the last podcast. It's just kind of like, why would I expect them to do something they haven't done yet? Like, like we have not been able to overcome that hurdle yet. So, like, I'm not going to believe that you're going to be able to do it until you do it. So that's what my expectation was. Did I expect them to play better? Yes. But, like, also that's where, like, the reason why I think I picked this to lose and kept the gold and blue glasses off is because, you know, they've had a tendency to coach speak a lot and kind of, like, hype up some things and, you know, Day day fire, we're getting a little bit of hype, but really not doing much. And, you know, it, it just like some of the similar questionable calls that happened. Like, those are things that are still happening, like year six in. And, like, I haven't, like, you know, we thought we'd get them resolved, but then they pop up for one random bad game at the end of last year, you know, and things like that, where they just like randomly happen. Uh, like in Oklahoma last year, where just all of a sudden your team doesn't play well. You know, you're like, oh, my team just went off the rails and didn't play the way that they usually play. I didn't expect that. And, you know, it just shows that it can still happen. You know, you listen to Neil Brown's post game, and it's like, if I if I knew I had that problem, I could have fixed it. And it's like, how do you not know your team at this point? How do you not know that there could be a problem? Like, if you can't feel it, you can't sense it. You just walked in there that day and then found out when you're down twenty to six. It's just a little suspicious to me. But 
you got the season to figure it out. So, you know, you weren't expected to win this one, despite what people say. So, you know, you got a chance to tune up against Albany and bounce back, maybe get a little bit of redemption on Pitt, run up the score, and then, you know, see what happens. Our future's in front of us. I'm sure they're taking it personally. If there's anybody taking it very worse than anybody else, it's Neil Brown and Garrett Green and company. You know, there's nobody more determined to prove us wrong than them. So, true. But like, that's where I came in. Like, I, th- I feel like West Virginia was getting a little overhyped. And myself, I wanted to believe it. Like, I was sitting in a trades with my dad the day beforehand. He's like, you think we actually got a chance? I was like, I really do. I was like, you know, he's got me believing – Team is what it's supposed to be, but again, like when, when just out of nowhere, like the team falls apart and doesn't, you know, something, something's up. That's just a bit strange. Well, I think that you know it's it's kind of something that we've talked about in the past, right? Like West Virginia thrives usually as the underdog when you know people don't see them coming and things like that, and it's almost like we we knew we were the underdog, but also leading up to the game, we were getting all this hype, all this build up. You know, you know the Pat McAfee show as great as it was. The whole time I'm watching it, it had gave me two different feelings. One of those was super proud, you know, super happy, you know, tearing up at different moments because, you know, them talking about some nostalgic things and then also getting hyped because they're talking about, you know, Garrett Heisman, they're, the crowd's chanting, trust the climb and stuff. But it also gave me this other feeling, this kind of eerie feeling of, is this going to come back to bite us? And unfortunately now in hindsight, it kind of did. Not saying that I regret the Pat McAfee show coming there or anything like that, but I'm just saying, did it make – the moment too big for us, you know, to where then we put too much pressure onto ourselves on the field. And, you know, cause even Neil Brown talked about in the post game seemed like for some reason that this offense had certain, like an anxiety feel to them early on in the game. And I think you could even sense that as a fan. And so I don't know if we just overhyped it so much to where it put too much on this team. And the moment was too big for them that they couldn't execute because that's one thing that we haven't really had to deal with yet was, you know, being expected to do something it's easy to you know go out and prove people wrong when they're not expecting much from you but when you see the whole state getting hype you see you know on ESPN they're getting giving you all this love with Pat McAfee and stuff so that made me feel that way and then also I was watching that and thinking you know who else is probably watching ESPN and watching this right now is probably Penn State so I think it did two different things it maybe made the moment feel too big for our players. And also it probably motivated Penn State a little bit as well. And they wanted to come in there and really make a statement themselves after having to sit through all that and watch it themselves. Yeah. But see, that's my – that's where I – you know, I actually talked about that exactly that last night on the drive home. Is I, I agree with you. I think that the Pat McAfee show and, like, as as much as I love Pat and – and how much he supports us and what his comments were the motivating factor for Penn state. James Franklin even said it himself. He, he said it himself, you know, cause he said, you know, he made the comments. He said, do you know what's waiting for you in Morgantown? GG's about to run wild on your, you know, all the, all those different things, which is, I love that he's saying those things. I don't want this yeah. to be taken wrong, but right. In the same context, those, James Franklin's like, you know, I try not to let my team say anything that could be used as bulletin board material. So he, he told us point blank there, you know, we're using that as motivation. You know, Pat McAfee's talking shit about you guys. What are y'all going to do about it? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They're on national media talking about this. But, but in the same, in the same token, in the same line of thinking of that, to me, when the hell is that going to stop being, such a detrimental factor for WVU. I mean, why, why does support and people giving you hype and people, you know, gaining attention around the program, why does that always equal failure for WVU whenever we get in these big games? Thinking back, and again, I'm not trying to like speak negatively about any one group or team or one person at all. I'm just saying these are facts. The only group in WVU history that has ever overcome that specific that has been the 88 team and the 92 team they both went undefeated they both played in big games I mean even the 88 team I guess you could argue that you know they lost the national championship game but that was largely due to major you know major Harris's injury but other than that even the Pat White teams from 05 to 07 they lost in regular season, what was – now, they won their bowl games, yes, but in the regular season, they lost the games that were the biggest games on their schedule. And sometimes they lost those games that weren't on their the biggest games on their schedule. I remember, you know, Pat's – I think sophomore year it was. We had a huge game with Louisville in Louisville. And that was a primetime matchup. Both teams were ranked in the top ten. Oh, and six. we went over there and we lost. 
in 06. Okay. Then you go and I, uh, I don't know if it was the next year or the same year, but then you go down to South Florida, you lose to USF. And then, you know, you, you flash forward and then you think about the teams, you know, in the big 12 conference, whenever we're playing Oklahoma and it's these top 10 games that we're playing them in. And then long story short, you know, we, we can't come up with, with them then, you know, and we always speak about how West Virginia could be on the rise to prominence and put themselves on a trajectory that could put them in line with some, some of these blue bloods in the future. You know what I mean? You never know what could happen, happen, but that's my main frustration with everything is when are we going to come up, uh, you know, with a win in these types of situations, especially at home. If we're going to say that we're one of the toughest places to play in all of college sports, when are we going to prove it? Like we just mm-hmm. mentioned the fan base and how they didn't come to, you know, show up and. Yeah. And I mean, if you support, guys were there, you, I like mean, were, oh, you guys were obviously there. There was a lot of white shirts there. <laughs> like there, there was buddy, a I was lot yelling of, top of my lungs and people were staring at me like I was crazy. I'm like, what? Yeah, where where are we at now? It should the be student the other way is five feet to my right, and they were going crazy, and nobody beside like I. It, yeah, they, I think, I and again, I this where it comes back to I I really think that the biggest detriment this whole game was it was a noon game. I think you give that game the slot it deserves. It's and, never been a factor before. We played Maryland in a noon game, and I remember we caused three straight um, delay of games in a row. Three straight. For a noon kickoff, that's just never been that detrimental of a factor for WVU. Like I get it. Like this game, this game should have been a night game. I agree with that. But I do. I also think that too much emphasis is being placed on it being a noon kickoff. Like we've games always used to be noon kickoffs. Hell, I think ninety percent of the games for for WVU whenever Pat and them played were noon kickoffs. And then they started getting away from that and going to the three thirty kickoff, and then you started getting six and seven and eight o'clock mat, uh, time slots in there too. But like, I don't know. I'm not going to drone on too much longer. I just, I really, my main frustration with everything that happened yesterday is one, I can take losing, but I can't take getting our asses whooped for lack yeah. of a better way of putting it for that group and that team with that potential i can't take that you know and then two fan base has got to do a lot better of a job than what they did yesterday because that from a fan from my from my opinion that was unacceptable and i've been to a lot of games i've been to over 200 football games in my lifetime and that's a lot when you only got six or seven and six or seven home football games in a season that's a lot of football games to go to them in a lifetime and that one had potential to be one of the top 5 atmospheres in wvu football history and it didn't even scratch the surface of anywhere near that so yeah it was but the first 5 minutes whenever the team took the football field was awesome it's like it's like everybody was just like waiting for them to be like oh, told you so you know what i mean like that's exactly ah, yeah, right i mean to be uh, honest with you okay so that's another thing i'll touch on and then i'll let you guys go uh, no brother you, you go so they something. changed they changed the section i don't know if it was just for this game but they changed the section of the visitor section so over it used to be over in the corner of the tunnel where the visiting team runs out okay all of that section yesterday was filled up with WVU fans and then the Penn State fans, there was a lot, a lot scattered throughout the entire stadium, but they had two predominant sections in the in both of the upper deck corners. Yeah. The far corners the corner of the upper zone, deck. Yeah. And those fans, I mean, and it's no surprise, there were some that I know I mentioned the ones right in front of us. Those guys, I mean, those to be honest with you, those guys ended up being kind of cool. Like they were just trying to be funny the whole time they were there so like i didn't really mind that they were being the way that they were but there were some that we ran into and that, i mean just obnoxious uh, just absolutely obnoxious like just groups of them ganging up on people and and it was vice versa too i'm not gonna lie but i mean those those fans showed up and they were loud i mean they they almost were a quarter of the the loudness of our entire crowd with just how little, you know, little in comparison of the people they had in comparison to ours. 
Yeah. And I mean, we're used to the big 12 where, you know, <laughs> you don't really have that. You know what I mean? Like even going to the Cincinnati game last year, when you're in like close proximity, it was less, but I also made a note that, you know, there's probably also a lot of Penn state fans because they could afford the tickets. Yeah. I feel like though, the crowd, you know, probably would have been different. You know, like Steven said, there was a little bit, you know, there at the beginning, there was some noise and stuff, but it's kind of something that we talked about in the preview uh, you know, is that you wanted to get the crowd involved early, you know, and they tried to, they did, you know, try shot play on the first play of the game, couldn't quite connect with it. But I think for me, what it boils down to is kind of just missed opportunities early that really, you know, pretty much cost you. I don't want to say they cost you the game because who knows how it would have ended up, but it, I feel like the game would have went a lot differently if you capitalize on those early opportunities, both for the players on the field and then for the atmosphere in the stadium as well. Because, you know, they talked about last year, they had some opportunities in the third quarter when it was still a seven point game. I feel like this game, you had opportunities in the first quarter when it was 0 0. You could have been the team that takes the lead, takes control of the game early. You get the early, the quick turnover from Penn State. And then you give it right back with a turnover of your own. And then you get the ball back again, and it's still 0-0. You put a good little drive together. You get down there, and then you can't convert a fourth and one on a QB sneak. And so, you know, two opportunities with the game 0-0 where you're in scoring territory and could have took the lead and took control of the game. And I think after that, the game turned and momentum kind of shifted and never really shifted back our way after that. So I think for me, those were some of the biggest moments of the game came right there in the first quarter that could have changed not only the way that the game went for the – for the team, but also maybe for the crowd as well. Yeah, when you don't get that energy in there, good time to talk about, you know, Neil Brown mentioned all the time going through summer camp, hey, red zone, red zone, red zone. Brother, you get some opportunities at it and you you flub. You know what I mean? Like you said, that's what you worked on and then you, you just don't even um, convert on it. And also personally, I, I agree the tush push is really good, but I also think that we have a six foot two, 240 pound log of a running back, you know, that we, we could just slam up just about anywhere and get a yard as well. So true to me, to me, if you're going to run Garrett green, that's when you pull him back into the shotgun and let him run. Yeah. Like, put him on the, out on the edge. like they do that, uh, other Yeah. Give him space and let him work. If you're going to go up the middle, dude, give it to your six foot two, 240 pound running back. This guy, you know, we'll see. I, I don't know. I think that a large part of the reason I think the GG struggled yesterday is because they haven't, I mean, they don't have just a good defensive front. They have an elite defensive front. And the main thing that everybody was talking about leading up to this game, we talked about all the hype that they gave him, was Garrett Green. Pat McAfee was gassing Garrett Green up, and rightfully so. I mean, Gigi is talented, we know. But, like, they keyed on him. And everybody's like, well, why does Gigi, why did Gigi suck? Why, why didn't he do well? I'm like, every guy on that defensive front was like, get that guy. <laughs> Yeah, like these guys tied him all game. He wasn't going to get got, anything. All of and us probably got felt him. a yeah. little uncomfortable and unusual without having Zach Frazier right in front of him and Doug Nestor yeah. over to the right of him. He probably felt a little bit new. You know what I mean? And a little bit more scared yeah. than normal. And then you lose yeah. Wyatt Milo. I'd be a little. Uncomfortable and that's a large too. reason. That's a large reason that it made Jaheim look extra special too, because Jaheim got open for some pretty good bursts there a couple of times before he got hurt, and even a f- few times after he came back into the game, but. I don't know. That's the reason. That's a large reason why that happened with Gigi. My main thing with the offense was as much as we revamped this receiving core and how many guys we brought in and this, that, and the third, with the exception of Preston Fox of late in the game. And Hudson Clement. I didn't see, sh- I didn't see nothing. I, to be honest with you, I really didn't. I, I seen a lot of dropped passes that should have been catches. Yeah. And I, I, and some missed throws that were supposed of, to be worked on in the offseason, too. You know, you're missing yes. Cole Taylor like, out there the was flat one on seen, a play where you're, like, down in the end zone again where you're not converting and you throw yes. a ball into just the dirt. Flat. That was, you said that was just a bad pass on Garrett Green's part. That's what I'm saying. But that, that was, like, was one of those things he said he worked on all year. Like you said, they yeah. had very few things to work on. That was one of them. And then big game, big moment, and you miss him. You hit him in the toes. Well, you know, multiple times they had shallow cross routes over the middle and, you know, just drop passes. I remember like receivers are getting hit from behind. I get that as contact, but you have to be able to make those catches as a division one receiver, catch the football. Okay. Like and I, I get it. Like there was one that Preston had that he was catching the ball, laying down backwards and the defender, like with his entire body just came across and forced the football out. That one. I'm like, I mean, you can't, there's no way to like, overturn that you like the ball's getting that's the just trailing race first pitch of the game like but, you you gotta hit that one dude but the ball's in your hands out here and you're getting hit from behind and you're dropping the football 
come I mean, that's just weak. I'm sorry, but you gotta muscle up, dude. You gotta get grow some kahunas about you and catch the fucking football. Yeah. I, I thought that was unacceptable. And then also on the defensive side of the ball, as much as I've heard about the the guys in the secondary, you know, Garnett Hollis and Aiden Garns and all these guys that we were really high up on, I still think that they're going to be good. But I didn't see anything out of those guys yesterday. And a large part of it, from what I could tell, was the, you know, the schemes that we were running on defense. They were just really good on offense about seeing that and and running plays that fit them, essentially. Because that's why that's why you see that. That's why you see a whole defensive shift to the other side is because offenses are good at at, at really disguising their their sets and it makes it look they're all going to one side and they're really going to the other side. So that was a large reason, a large part of the reason that it made them look worse than what they really were. But again, you know, if we're if we're talking about being elite on both sides of the football, why are we having those issues? to where we can't even be competitive with people like that because now it puts us in in a hard position if we do make the playoff and we show up and we play like that. Yeah, well, and like to that point, like you talk about you come to where you can't even run your offense because you can't run a motion, you can't get your snap right. And then like you just cut that out of your whole playbook. Like is that because it's Penn State and you're like, ah, well, if it's better not to just use it. But what's a bigger note of like not having confidence in your team than saying, hey, Two bad snaps, we got to scrap our whole offense. Like I know it's scary, but you're looking at your guys and saying, "Ah, well, if we can't do this, we can't do this." And it's just, you know, that's that's concerning because that's not something that's just going to happen against Penn State. It, it, Penn State didn't do anything special to mess that up. You know what I mean? Now you got a chance to correct it and make sure it doesn't happen again. But that's what made No Brown's offense so good last year, and that's what's making offense so good right now. Kodo Nicky's the same way. Is that motion keeping people on their toes? Never letting people know where your offense is coming from is what offenses are doing. Like it's it, that's how you are successful in the game right now. And if you can't even do that when it was a big part of your offense last year, it, you're starting to regress. And that's where I think it's unacceptable. That that's one thing you can't show me. So you can lose to Penn State, but I expect you to look good while you do it. I don't expect you to take a step back. You lost a few good pieces, but you put them back in with pieces you've been working on. But you you, you can't take a, a step backwards. That's not where we're going. You know, that's that's not the direction we're going in. And so like, that's where it gets scary. Making bad calls, going for it, uh, going for two points when you could just go down by 14 and get in the game. That's 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 not Penn State. That's you. You know, and that's where it comes back to the scary part of all this is, you know, you think all this is fixed. And like Neil Brown said, I didn't know I had a problem with it. I didn't know we were still doing this, uh, you know. Yeah, and I told you guys like right before the podcast came on, I think the biggest mistake of the game is when he didn't try to score a touchdown before the fourth quarter. I think you you, you got a drive going, you got energy, you got momentum, you're pushing the defenses on their heels. You got eight, ten seconds, you're lined up. You can run a play. You, you're set up, ready to go. You sat and let five, six seconds run off the clock. In that chance, you take a shot at the end zone, you score a touchdown. You're not walking into the fourth quarter, down two touchdowns, momentum, energy, and the building's going, we're only down two scores. You get one stop, you're back in the game. But now you let it go to the fourth quarter, then you spend three minutes, three minutes. I think I got down to the 12-minute marker, if I remember correct, just trying to punch it in from the red zone. And so, like, there you just wasted three minutes here the whole time. Penn State's got it easy now. And you struggle to score it then. For me, like, you can't keep doing that. Like, that's that six years are the same thing no matter who the opponent's been. Come on. Yeah. Offense has to play better. The biggest defining difference to me was not having Zach Frazier. And I thought that it would be mm. pretty seamless. You know, we had Brandon Yates play center in a, for us in a bowl game last year. Well, what, the last two games, I mm-hmm. think, even? Whenever Zach Frazier went down and there wasn't really any kind of – any any hiccups. And then you got, what, two or three even uh, – three crazy snaps yesterday that caused fumbles. And whether but that's those, Brandon uh, Yates those or Derek, Derek Green and uh, Neil Brown both said were on, on GG. You know, he called for the snaps at the wrong time. That's why they went away from, you know, the motion and stuff they were using because uh, they had some good stuff called up with that motion. And Neil Brown said he even thought that the play, you know, when they got the ball fumble from Penn State and then turned right around and fumbled it as well, that that was going to be a big play and possibly even a touchdown. But GG called for the snap too soon, and that's why it hit the, hit the motion, man. So then they had to get away from using their motion and shifts that they had a good game plan against Penn State's defense from. And I think that's why our offense kind of died down because they didn't feel comfortable doing it because 
whatever was going on with Gigi. You know, I love him to death, but that's probably one of the worst games I've seen him play, to be honest with you. And I don't know, if, like I said earlier, if it was a thing where, you know, put too much pressure on himself because the moment was so big and everyone was so hyped for him. But, you know, even something as small as that, you know, he's a senior. He shouldn't be calling for the snap at the wrong time. It's just – I don't know. It's just something that, that can't happen. Game. Yeah. I don't know. So, it seemed to me, you know, possibly that – with everything leading up to it, maybe, you know, the team, especially on the offensive side, just didn't have their minds right, you know, coaching staff as well. But if you want to not have that problem and you do want to have your mind right all the time, one way that you can always do that, of course, is with Magic Mind. Um, you guys know yesterday driving up to Morgantown, driving back, could be tiresome today, you know, on Sunday having to go back to work a full shift and stuff. But I really wasn't. I felt pretty good. And one reason that I did is just because of Magic Mind. Using it, you know, keeps your energy level up. And it does it in an all-natural way, so you don't have to worry about any risky benefits like you do with other energy products. So you guys know we can't recommend Magic Mind enough. Help your anxiety levels, help you focus, all of that good stuff. And if you want to get Magic Mind, you can do it with our special code here at the Country Roads webcast. That's CountryLT20 at checkout. If you go to magicmind.com slash countrylt, where you can get up to 48% off your first subscription and 20% off a one-time purchase. So go ahead and do it, guys. Get your mind right. Be ready for your day, unlike the West Virginia was against Penn State. But, hey, you don't have that problem if you're using Magic Mind. So head over to magicmind.com slash countrylt. Use the code countrylt20 at checkout and try yours today. Having said that, gentlemen, any other thoughts here on the game in general before we take a look at some numbers, uh, talk about some stats, and then get into uh, some Big 12 scores? Yeah, I feel like we didn't really talk defense at all, but he, same thing there. Look, look the same. DB, DB's getting beat. Uh, that, that just seemed like the whole game to me. Mistakes, people being where they're not supposed to be, not knowing where they're supposed to be there. Like That was the whole defensive day for me. I, was say, we kind of, I think we avoided that on purpose because <laughs> – yeah. There was really anything positive. Yeah, but if we're going to beat up the offense, we've got to beat up the people that let them score 34. Well, I think for me, you know, the, yeah, the defensive backs got beat, but I kind of am attributing to that a little bit to Kodernicki's scheme. You know, he's he draws up some good stuff to, you know, put our guys in, in peril a little bit there on the back end. But what I probably was most disappointed with on the defense was how the defensive line played. Like I said earlier, Penn State dominated the trenches. Of course, they dominated our offensive line at times, especially in short yardage. But we really didn't get any pressure on Drew Aller all day. And when we did, he was able to break out, break contain, and, you know, run for first downs on those third downs. So I think for me, the defensive line was probably my biggest disappointment on the defense. Because mm -hmm. you're right, it looked like they just bullied no pressure, that's right. our guys all day. Yeah, no sacks, and they run for you know 220 some yards. Uh, not a good day for your D line. They've got to they've got to step it up there uh, for sure. So that's probably what I'm going to be watching over these next couple of weeks. Uh, is specifically us in the trenches on both sides of the football. I think our offensive line is going to be better than what they showed against Penn State. I'm kind of attributing that to Penn State having a dominant D-line, but we definitely need to make sure of that because we do have, you know, some changes on that offensive line. Like you guys mentioned, Frazier and Nestor being gone. So hopefully our offensive line plays better. And, you know, I think the defensive line can as well. Yeah. The question mark I look at, Rodney Gallagher was out there early. He was out there early, and then he was like watching him trying to tackle that Penn State defender. Granted, he just went for his legs is what he should have done. Unpopular opinion. Unpopular opinion. I'm not a fan of the dude playing both ways. It already seems to me like it's just it's gassing him way too early in the football game yeah. when we could be utilizing him at one of the – either one. Like, just pick a position and play that position. I mean, he had our probably best – you know, we tried to throw a few screen passes on offense. Most of them didn't go anywhere, but the one we threw to him gained, you know, eight or nine yards. So, on offense, he made a play, and then uh, – I. You know, on defense, I don't want to necessarily say he struggled because I don't think he really had enough reps to say he played good or bad. But Neil Brown did say in the post-game press conference that, you know, it was a little bit fast for him, and that's why you didn't see him back out there on defense in the second half. So if, if the game's moving too fast for him on defense, maybe just stick to him on offense, let him improve his game there, like you're saying, Stephen, and, you know, just ride that out. I don't know. Well, I mean, maybe next week, you know, coming up this week, coming up against Albany, he'll get a chance to play defense and it'll slow things down for him on that side. But if it doesn't and he's still struggling, just let him be an offensive player. Well, that's what, you know, like Neil Brown, for one, Neil, stop saying shit because I believe it. This <laughs> is like, you know, you, he's like, well, our well, probably our best coverage guy on man to man is is Rodney Gallagher. I'm like, oh, oh man, okay, because I feel like we got some coverage guys. 
I mean, within he wasn't even within two yards of the dude on on just a simple out a five yard out route. Like okay. on a, I was on a fourth down. Yeah. I'm not saying I can play the position. I'm just saying if you're gonna gas somebody up that much and say he can, then like I watching him try to tackle that that wide receiver, I was like, that's just sad. Like that that's a person that's a wide receiver just trying to like take out some legs. But like, what does that say about where we're at that position that he's getting? significant play time in the red zone you know what i mean like where are we at i mean like that's just that i mean let's call it what it is it's the travis hunter effect like that wouldn't have happened if travis hunter wasn't also doing it but the reason travis hunter does that is because he's elite at doing it but i will also say like at this point i I think i'm saying more like jordan leslie like we have not had a competent db like we've had like certain shining stars like beanie bishop last year granted he was getting targeted a lot for a reason but like it, it We've not had a competent DB field since Jamal dies left, and we all know that. It's just what it is, what it is, and I don't know why that is, but something over there is not working. And I would say, even if Neil Brown, you know, if he has a struggle season but still has a winning season and gets through it, if our defense struggles, you got to make a change because this is too many seasons in a row. I, I think personally, even if it's not just, even if it's not a change as far as like a coaching change, we got to do something different schematically somewhat because I feel like we're just far too conservative on defense. Like we don't bring a lot of blitzes. We're rushing three guys or four guys almost every time and just sitting back either in, you know, cover three zone and they're, they were picking that apart. And then when we tried to go man to man, that wasn't working either because our, our D backs couldn't cover those wide receivers. Apparently, you know, Penn state has some talented guys, of course. So hats off to them, but, if we're not going to be able to cover people, whether we're sitting in zone or whether we're sitting in man, then let's at least heat up, heat up the quarterback and you know try and make something happen that way. Because sitting back and playing conservative just isn't doing it. No, that, the whole giving receivers a cushion of five yards every time and then just trying to catch them—that's not working. Because then you're trying to make arm tackles and you can't do that because you're so weak you can't bring the guys down. And that's why those big plays happened a lot of times. And then even you know that. I will say the first big pass play that Penn State got was it, it was offensive pass interference. Mm-hmm. Like it just the dude pushed him off. I mean that was just plain as day. I don't know how you don't call that. But besides that, I mean they just burnt our guys like all day long on the back end. And I mean like it's just it's frustrating because you've seen these players play better than that. Like you know that they're better than than that. So it's all got to be from a scheme from a scheme standpoint because not every single player is going to just always give you five yards they're better than that so i don't understand why why jordan leslie continues to do because they've they've done that for the entirety of his tenure as defensive coordinator i've noticed that they whenever they start to feel like they're getting burnt they're like okay five yard cushion and then just go get the guy but then they just they they can't tackle yeah then you get nickel and dime down the field too you just get 15 yard 15 yard 15 yard and then well, and that's the problem when you're playing a team like Penn State that you know probably, you know, has more talent than you. Obviously, they have a very talented roster. They recruit, you know, up near the top of the nation. What's your advantage going to be is probably schematically. You're going to have to out-scheme these guys. And so not only were they more talented than us, but they out-schemed us on both sides of the football, and that's a recipe for disaster, and that's why we ended up with the result that we did. But, hey, uh, at least, well, we won the special teams battle. <laughs> that's, a, that's a bright spot, right? Michael Hayes is a good kicker. Never had a chance to return a punt, though. No. No, we didn't. I uh, would like to see uh, Preston Fox do that. But, hey, um, Michael Hayes and Oliver Straw had good games. You know, players of the game right there. <laughs> players of the game. MVP. All right, gentlemen, let's take a look at some numbers and then let's uh, put this game behind us and look ahead to uh, brighter days, hopefully. All right, we'll take a look at the team stats here first. Obviously, 34-12 to 12 final. You see the scoring broke down by quarter there if you're watching on the screen on the video version. You know, the second quarter is when Penn State really kind of broke the game open. It was 0-0 after one. West Virginia had plenty of chances in that first quarter that we talked about. Uh, third quarter, Penn State adds another seven. West Virginia finally gets the ball in the end zone in the fourth quarter, adds another six to get to the 34-12 final. First downs in the game, 21 for Penn State, 19 for West Virginia. Third down efficiency, 5 of 11 for Penn State, 4 of 14 for the Mountaineers. Penn State 1 of 1 on fourth downs, WBU 3 of 4. Total yardage, just huge discrepancy here when we get into these numbers. 457 for Penn State to 246 for the Mountaineers. Passing 235 for Penn State, WBU passed for 161. 
Um, of course, West Virginia did throw the one interception. That was when Nico came in late in the game there. Rushing-wise, unfortunately, West Virginia sees their streak of 16 consecutive games with 140-plus rushing yards snapped as they only managed to run for 85 yards in this game. Penn State, meanwhile, rips off 222 yards. West Virginia does play, you know, disciplined as far as penalties are concerned. Um, eight penalties for Penn State, only one on the Mountaineers. WVU loses the turnover battle 3-1. to one two fumbles and the aforementioned interception. Uh, time of possession ended up about even, but a lot of that is because, you know, Penn State getting the ball later in the second half, kind of working the clock. West Virginia did have a good advantage on time possession early in the game in the first half. So uh, looking at some of those numbers, gentlemen, uh, what sticks out the most to you there, Stephen? I really was trying to find, you know, other than the box score, <laughs> what what really jumped out at me. I mean, obviously the total yardage, you got 200 and some. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the running yards for sure. We did. I mean, the running yards are the rushing that's where yards. we're at. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, you Jordan like Jordan's been saying it for years now. You know that when Neil Brown gets over 100 yards, he he usually wins. Yeah. And when you don't even scratch that, when you've got three dominant running backs, that's 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 your issue right there. You can't get that running game going. They made us one dimensional, and then they tore us up. Well, I think it was like Gigi had what like 10 rushes for like five, five yards. Years. In for five, yeah. Something crazy like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's just not – And it didn't even feel like he had like a chance to scramble. Like, it, it never felt like he had a chance to do what he did best. And I don't yeah. know why yeah. that is necessarily – because let me remind you all, I'm just a man that loves West Virginia football. I am no football guru. I have watched a lot of football. But I'm just on here because I love us, you know, love the Mountaineers. So, but come on now. Well, I mean, Penn State, they was loading the box. They were running, you know, cover one with a spy on Garrett Green so that if he did, you know, get out of the pocket, they had a guy, you know, chasing him around simply accounting for him. But if someone's going to load the box on you and plus they're running, you know, a spy on your quarterback, that's one less guy in coverage. We should have been able to pass the ball better than what we did in this football game. The rushing numbers stick out. But, um, you know, since Brad mentioned that, I'm going to say the passing numbers stick out to me because – 161 is not going to get it done, but what really is not going to get it done is, you know, 15 of 29, Garrett Green, you know, being 28 of those, 15 to 28. The one thing they've talked about throughout fall camp and people have harped on is the completion percentage getting that up. They said it had really improved through fall camp. But in this game, it's right where it was last year, you know, 54% for Garrett Green. Not going to get it done, especially when it's a game where Penn State's pretty much daring you to throw the football and you're not able to do it. Some of that's on Garrett Green. Some of that's on the receivers, as I mentioned earlier, drops and not getting separation. So that's going to have to be something that improves. But also, you know, our run game needs to set that up. That's kind of what our offense is going to hinge on is the run game. And if we're not getting the run going, it's not going to be able to take our play action deep shots. It was just bad performance on, you know, both both passing and rushing for the offense. So, you know, you can really point out either one of those. When you only gain 246 total yards, it's a bad day at the office. Mm-hmm. Let's take a look at the uh, individual numbers real quick, and then we will get ready to wrap this one up after we talk about some of the Big 12 scores. From week one, um, for the Mountaineers here, 161 yards for Garrett Green on 15-28, to 28, as we said. Drew Aller, another strong performance, just like he did last year. 216 yards and only 11 completions, so shows they were you know hitting some chunk plays down the field. Three touchdowns for him, no interceptions. Uh, the other quarterback that they played, Perbula, ended up one of one for 19 yards and a touchdown. Rushing-wise, C.J. ends up the lead rusher for the Mountaineers, 12 carries, 42 yards, and a touchdown. But I thought Jaheim White had some good runs and, you know, in the first half prior to him injuring. I believe they said it was his shoulder. He did come back in the second half, but – wasn't as effective at that point. He ends up with eight for 33 yards. Uh, Nicholas Singleton, big day for Penn State, 13 carries, 114 yards and a touchdown. Aller hurting on some scrambles, as we mentioned, 44 yards rushing for him on six carries. Receiving-wise, uh, best receiver in this game uh, was on Penn State side. Harrison Wallace really killed us, especially in the that second quarter there. Five catches, 117 yards, two of those being touchdowns. Amari Evans, two for 55. Uh, the tight end, Tyler Warren, three for 30 and a touchdown. And, of course, we mentioned Katron Allen uh, with that 20-yard touchdown reception as well. For West Virginia, Preston Fox, two catches, 41 yards. Probably had the best day of the Mountaineers receivers. Hudson Clement added two catches, 34 yards, and Traylon Ray, Four catches, 37 yards uh, for WVU. Um, then on the defensive side, Josiah Trotter, really the standout for the Mountaineers, leading the team in tackles with 10, five of those being solo. Anthony Wilson added nine tackles. Thought he played uh, pretty good as well. Uh, then on Penn State side, uh, Kevin Winston Jr., 12 total tackles. Jalen Reed, nine tackles, a TFL. 
Tony Rojas, a tackle and a half for a loss. Zane Duran, a tackle and a half for a loss. Um, and, of course, uh, that uh, another guy come in and force a fumble on Garrett Green on a nice strip sack play. So their defense was really flying around in the football game. Uh, anything you guys want to add there on the uh, individual numbers? Josiah had a good day. You guys were right about – you guys might be right about him being the, the leading tackler this yeah, year. Yeah, the top four on that list don't surprise me. Now, Reed Carrico also, I think he – yeah, that's uh, what that one didn't surprise me. Seeing Reed Carrico when I felt oh, like I've been, I've been pretty excited about him. He transferred from Ohio State. So play, he's got a good defensive pedigree, you know, to transfer from a place like that. So that's why I was excited about him. But where do you see any of your defensive linemen at? Yeah, that was about the same thing I was about to say, Brad. When you look at our leading tacklers, linebacker, defensive back, linebacker, defensive back, defensive back, defensive back. You don't get to a lineman until you get down here to Fator Mamolba. So, I mean, that's obviously showing you how much Penn State was dominating in the trenches when most of your tackles are coming from your back end of your defense. Mm-hmm. Just another thing that shows, though, not the best day for West Virginia, unfortunately, but that's a look at the numbers in this one, uh, both team and individual-wise. Any final thoughts on uh, Penn State, West Virginia, before we uh, take a look at the other games around the Big 12 and do our around the Big 12 Week 1 recap, guys? Hopefully we don't play them for another 35 years. I wouldn't be mad about it. Yeah. Like I said, it, 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 I shouldn't have been expected to win that one. Season's not over. It's long. Big 12's wide open, but we're going to have to win some big games if we want to make it to Dallas in December. So, yeah, right, get focused, shrug it off, and, you know, let's hope that that was a, a fluke, a one-time gimmick. That's it. We have to come on here and talk about it on the podcast. Then we're going to put it behind us. The team's got to watch the film of it. Hopefully it's a learning process for them and they can put it behind them as well. Look forward to Albany. Look forward to the rest of your schedule. And, you know, that's the good thing about the 12-team playoff this season is that non-conference games are kind of more insignificant than ever before. Really, you just need to use them as learning opportunities, get yourself right for conference play, and go out there and try and win the Big 12, get to the Big 12 title game, which is this team's goal. So, We'll see what happens when that comes around. Got a couple games to get through first that hopefully uh, we'll play a lot better in. But, yeah, definitely not mad to put this one behind us, guys. Having said that, let's take a look at the Around the Big 12 segment here in our uh, first review and reaction podcast of the season here on episode 191. Looking at some of the scores here from Thursday, UCF handles New Hampshire 57-3. to Kansas takes down Lindenwood 48-3. to uh, Colorado with a nice, you know, win there at the end, you know, holding off North Dakota State. Unfortunately, you guys know I was pulling for North Dakota State in that one, but they gave him a heck of a game. Colorado's defense looks suspect a little bit again, but Travis Hunter's a hell of a football player, man. You got to give it to him for that. He almost single handedly yeah. won them that game with, you know, that incredible touchdown catch. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, uh, yeah. Utah, 49 to 0 over Southern Utah. To Southern Utah, Utah we thought we had that one. I thought I had that one dialed in. I thought <laughs> Southern I was Utah, that. man. Southern Utah. We thought we thought they were going to pull the rabbit out of the hat, but nah, no. Cameron Rising, I think five touchdowns in his uh, first performance back there in his twenty second year of college football. Um, then we go on to the Friday game. TCU gets the win over the ACC, thirty four to twenty seven in a close contest, beating Stanford in that late game there. And then, of course, the Saturday slate. We know what the Mountaineers did, following thirty-four to twelve, Oklahoma State uh, forty-four to twenty over South Dakota State, Cincinnati thirty-eight to twenty over Towson, Iowa State twenty-one to three over North Dakota, Baylor forty-five to three over Tarleton, Kansas State forty-one to six over UT Martin, and uh, UNLV handling Houston. We were talking about, you know, in the preview show. That Dana leaving the cupboard bare a little bit seems like he's done it again as UNLV handles Houston uh, twenty-seven to seven. Abilene I Christian, not, I, did, I have not seen that Texas Tech score yet. Yeah. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, Abilene Christian nearly upset Texas Tech. Texas Tech's able to pull it out in overtime, but Texas Tech's you know we're worried about you know our defense, but at least we played Penn State. Texas Tech's secondary gave up a ton of yardage uh, to Abilene Christian's quarterback, and they barely pulled out. They give up fifty-one points. They pulled out in overtime, fifty-two to fifty-one. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, that's one of the more interesting scores to come out of the Big Twelve. Do you remember um, to play Texas Tech Big one? Year, man. We play them last game of the season. Oh, thank God! Never mind. The yeah. Down there, but we play. Well, they'll be they'll be approved. They'll be uh, get everything right by then. That's that'll just mm-hmm. be our luck. <laughs> uh, BYU and Southern Illinois. BYU with a big win there, forty-one to thirteen. 
Arizona State, uh, 48 to 7 over Wyoming. Thought that would be a closer game. And then Arizona, 61 to 39 over New Mexico. Arizona's defense didn't look the best, but guys, T Mac, 300 plus yards receiving and only 10 catches. One of the best performances in week one. Their passing game's looking, you know, as expected, but their defense, you know, maybe leaving a little bit left to be desired. But uh, what anything you guys want to comment on here as far as the Big 12 scores from uh, week one? Yeah, Texas Tech. Holy crap. Yeah. I blame Last Christian. Wake up with some people this year. <laughs> Houston is still bad. Um, Arizona, I might have been very, very wrong about. They got to uh, get the defense fixed, but their offense is, it seems and, to be a still be firing. They've shown that that can win and, before. So. And it's going to be why you Cougars. Woo! It's going to be you. I was waiting on that one, Steven. I was waiting on the, you to shout out the BYU Cougars getting that win. So that's what we had there. Uh, wow, that's a tough game with Southern Illinois there. Tough game. Yeah. They pulled out. Tough they pulled game. out. Double digit, double digit victory. So that's kind of the results there from around the Big Twelve in Week One as we get set to uh, wrap up our first review and reaction podcast of the 2024 season. Unfortunately, you know, not on the best of terms. We would like to be talking about a win instead of a loss. But hey, that just means you know we got opportunity to get right against Albany, and Albany's a team that you know. Had a good season in FCS. We'll talk about it more, of course, on our preview show coming later this week. But if you're looking at a silver lining, uh, West Virginia, you know, they'd have beat Penn State. Maybe they'd have been overlooking Albany. That's certainly not going to be the case now. I think they're going to be uh, super ready for this football game, and hopefully they take out their frustration on Albany this weekend. And, um, you know, everyone get to Morgantown, stay behind this team, keep supporting them, because that's kind of the final thought that I have here, guys, as we get uh, close to wrapping this up is just, I don't like the overreaction from a week one loss to a top 10 team that, you know, people are saying, oh, man, we'll be lucky to make a bowl game. Oh, fire the whole coaching staff. You know, you're already seeing that after just a loss to Penn State. And let's just pump the brakes. It's week one. You know, crazy stuff happens in week one in college football. Let's not forget last year, Oklahoma State lost 37 to 7 to South Alabama and then turned around and won the conference. So a lot of things can change throughout this season. West Virginia's goals are still in front of them. You know, if we get to week four, week five, into Big 12 play and we look like that, then we can talk. But right now, let's just stick behind this team and, you know, keep supporting them moving forward, I think. Yeah, there's been – I've i seen a lot of people say that, well, you know, how are we still have – you know, how are we still this bad of a team, you know, this far into Neil Brown's tenure? And I'm like, let's not, for, let's not forget, okay? He was left with nothing, pretty much. Nothing in terms of recruits. He's had, what is it, his sixth year going into his sixth year now? Is his sixth year, yeah. His sixth year, I would say, with an asterisk, it's pretty much his fifth year because, you know, you got a COVID in there and so that stalls, that, you know, halts things. I think he's done a phenomenal job of building our program back to where it has culture, where we have quality depth, where we have, you know, really excitement building around our program, even with our team not being ranked right now. That's what I think a lot of people that was lost on a lot of people, the way that we were getting attention this past weekend. And I, you know, we talked about it. We came up short and that's that, but the attention that we were getting was like, we were a ranked program. You know what I mean? I don't ever remember in my lifetime West Virginia garnering that much attention around a game when they're not ranked. So that that is really cool. So there's a lot of positives to take out of it. I think that the platform that we got, that we were put on was really positive this weekend. But I I truly do think we're still going to have a special season this year. But I think the Neil Brown is is going to eventually be remembered as one of the greatest coaches in WV football history when it's all said and done. Because, I mean, we we get impatient and we are frustrated. I know I'm frustrated. But, I mean, my gosh, like we got to remember like in the, the longevity of things, like how recent it is that we didn't have anything in the cupboard there because we went for a whole decade with Dana Holgerson not, not, gaining, like, not getting recruits and not really recruiting for the future. And that really sets an entire program back. I don't think people are like, you know, it's time for his, for everything to start, you know, being a product now, which is true in a lot of ways, but also in some ways, like 
it's not necessarily to me anymore about like, well, you got to win now or you're fired. You know, if he wins, if he wins eight games this year, I still consider that a success. It's just such an overreaction because people are saying that, and it's it's one game into the season. He could win the next eleven. You know, what I'm saying, and then and then who looks and then who looks dumb if he does? It's the people that are saying that after one week, one loss to a top ten team. You know, what I'm saying he's not going to be. No, Brown's not going to be the one looking dumb if he turns this thing around. It's going to be the people that were saying this crazy overreactive stuff after you know one week. Yeah, and I and I think I'm going to be one of those dumb people though. I because. I, I'm just like having more realization where it's like I'm sitting back and I'm looking at it and the, the program's getting everything it needs. Like Steven said earlier, the fans, like they showed up. They may not have been as energetic, but like they got the Pat McAfee show. Ren Baker's getting us all attention in the world. They're getting as much support as they need. NIL is getting bigger than ever. They're pushing for everything. And when it comes down to it is love Neil Brown, love the culture he's building. And I believe, I want to believe that it could win, you know, and I, I know that kind of culture can win. But again, when you look at it, is is Neil Brown just going to be a 500 coach? You know what I mean? It, it, is that just where it's at? Because when you look at it, and somebody made this Facebook post, so I'm gonna I'm gonna call it out here from Thorn Thorn, and he's breaking down Neil Brown's record over the past 61 games uh, against losing teams. Neil Brown is 18 and four. Great um, against teams that are six and six. He's 0 and one. Um, Against six win teams that are winning teams, they is five and one. He has two wins over a seven win team. He's two and four against an eight win team. He's two and six, and then nine, ten, and beyond, all with at least one game, he's lost. So against winning teams, Neil Brown is nine and twenty five in his time here. Now you can chalk up maybe some of those his early years, but it still just shows when it comes down to it. Can he get it done against the good teams when it matters? And so far, he's not shown that to us yet. So, like this year, with our schedule coming up the way it is, if you don't find some of those wins, we're not going to do great. And right now, history is saying that you're not. Right now, though, you may have one of the best teams that you've had since you've been here, though. But what I saw last night is not as good as what I saw as a team that played even in Penn State last year. You know, it, it seemed like another step back. And like I said, you got a whole season to figure that out. You got a nice tune-up game at Albany. You got Pitt that you can go up there and you can you can really stomp them because they don't seem like they're going to have a good year. You know, kind of do what you did last year after the Penn State game. But this is the year that you, to me, that you got to prove that you can get those coin flips. That you that you can not only get some nine wins, but that you can beat some damn good teams on your way to doing it. That you can show up and and, and handle them. And that's that's what you got to see. And and I I think that I am one of those people that it's like. At this point, Hoppy Kirchhoff said it earlier today on the um, three guys, great show today. He said, you know, this is year three for Nell Brown. And, like, I just don't know how I feel about that because it is. But, like, it's really hard to say that when you sit here and say that he's had, you know, six years. Yeah, he had to hit a full reset button. But whose fault is that? Is it Shane Lyons? That's fine. But now that we're in year three, we got to figure this out. You know what I mean? Like, we got to see that next big step over last year because you already sowed what you could do last year in year two. So, like, you got to take that next step. And then, you know, but then Tony Caridi came out and really impassionate, just put a stop to it because they took some pretty hard questions from that question line. And Tony Caridi came out and he put a stop to it and he said, listen, he said, I don't remember if it was Bobby Bowden or Don Yulin, forgive me all, not that experience, especially in the older days. But he said in year six and seven of that coach, he said his two games against Penn State, he was 0-48 was a score. He said between those two games added together, that's what the score was. And those are some of the greatest coaches that we've had. So at the same time, think about it. So that that's where I'm at. You know, like I'm optimistic. I'm so excited for the rest of the year. I think our ball team's going to get together. But there's still some questionable things, I think, when it comes to, to, to Neil Brown and some of the calls we've seen. And I think that those have cost us some games. And I, I got to see us beat really good teams this year to convince me otherwise somewhat. No, and I, I'm not. I'm not saying that you're wrong. I I agree with you as far as we haven't really won the big games yet. But I'm just I'm putting that caveat in there of yet because I think that it's going to happen this season. You know, maybe it's the golden blue glasses on with it's me or whatever. Season to happen though. We got plenty of yeah, them to try. And if it doesn't happen this season, that's what I'm saying. You know, later this season, maybe we could talk because those things are true that you're saying about him. You know, not beating any winning teams yet. But I'm chalking that up to you know the complete reset, the cover being bare, and it taking right. a long yeah. time for us to get to the point where we can compete with these other teams. Um, 
you know, I I was being optimistic on the Penn State game, but look at our history against Penn State. None of our coaches have really beat Penn State at a consistent rate. So, you know, I think moving through this season, you know, if we can beat, you know, the Kansas, the Kansas States, the Iowa States, the teams that are probably going to have winning records at the end of the year, then maybe we can say, okay, there's improvement there. He's finally winning some of these games that matter. But if we get to those games and, you know, it's more of what we've seen in the past, then you can definitely have a discussion because you got to start having those wins over winning teams at some point. And I think especially now in year six, you could probably make that argument that it's time for that to happen. I just personally believe that it's going to happen. Uh, but if it doesn't, then we'll see. Yeah. But doing it against Penn State would have bought you a lot of grace in that aspect. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> you know, because now you're expected to not just get one. You need to I was actually going to touch on that Bobby Bowden thing as you were saying that, Brad. Like, you know, they were. Is it Bobby Bowden? Okay. There were people in Morgantown that, like, vandalize his house that they they wanted him out of morgantown so bad because he was doing so bad in the first i think like four seasons or five seasons that he was in morgantown like we had had such a great program before he got there i mean but they chased him out of morgantown and then he goes to florida state and he's one of the greatest college football coaches that ever to you know to ever coach the game so i just mean like i think especially west virginia fans and i'm i'm guilty of this but i've I'm impatient. I think a lot of us are just too impatient. And I think a lot of that is that we're just spoiled from recency. You know, we, we obviously, we grew up spoiled getting to watch Pat White and Owen Schmidt and Steve Slayton and all those guys. And, you know, we spent a large majority of our childhood telling people that they were going to get the job done while they were telling us that they wouldn't. And those guys actually did go out and get the job done. Right. Yep. You know, especially in those in the bowl games, those bigger games. Um, so I, we're spoiled with that mindset, I think. So we really, truly, that's why we believe that West Virginia can get back to prominence one day. Mm-hmm. But you know, a, for the large part of West Virginia's history, you know what I mean. Like it's not, it's not been that quick of a process for coaches to take over and and have success like that it's usually taken them a while I mean, even don nealon took him a while to to gain a good you know base of recruiting classes to where he could have successful teams he got there in 1980 i believe it might have been 1979 he didn't pe- he didn't beat penn state until 1984 okay and they played him every year and they got their butts whooped every year I don't know. this we're not strictly basing everything off of penn state but in in terms of history like the litmus test of what they have have had to go through in history, that's what we're basing things off of. I, I do agree with you on that. Like this team does have to show certain elements for for you know for it to still be poli- belief and trust the climb. But the climb isn't over yet. I think a lot of the people, and I'm guilty, I think of this in this off season, was thinking that the in a way that the climb was over and that we had reached that peak. You know what I mean? Like, man, I don't think so. I think it's a continuous climb up. Uh, you know, probably for, for even several more years. But I think that, you know, even like eight and nine win seasons in a Big 12 conference as competitive as that we're, that we're playing in is not is not a bad year. But I still think the potential to win 10 games. I, I blame you, Cruz, by the way, for, for building me up to believe that we could win this Penn State game because in the SPR, I did. I predicted us to lose this game, and I still hold true to that sentiment that we're going to lose this <laughs> in the Oklahoma State game. Still I potential. I, I can take I can take part of that credit. You asked me yeah. up and you made me believe all that credit. <laughs> I was I was being super optimistic and I was you know trying to talk you into it. So yeah, I guess a little bit of that's on me. But hey, I wasn't the only one. Pat McAfee did a little bit as well. He did. He did. Mm. You're right. But I mean, I was when when Neil Brown walked up on stage and was handing out beers and a bottle of liquor. I texted Chai and I said, we're going to kill them. I said, they got no chance. <laughs> I, I was like, that, what that coach you went good. around just like passing out country roads, trust beer. He said, I got a chance to promote. I'm going to do it Do everything. Right. But, and that's, you know, and like, that's what I'm saying. Like, I agree. Like I, I will take no Brown for the next 15 years. If that means he's averaging eight and four, you yeah. know, like I, I'll take that. But brother, at this point, you got to show me that you're not a, a six and six. Yeah. That can hit a I nine and four. You gotta show you gotta show me you're an eight and four that can hit a eleven and one, not a six and six that can hit a nine and four. Because one of those yeah. I can. Well, and I think you know, like you said, with that record earlier, that's one thing I want to see us do this year is beat you know 
a top 25 team, beat a team that, you know, is having a good year. I want to see that happen. And I want to see us get into the top 25. Those are two things I want to see this year that would make me, you know, happy and, and be able to say, okay, yeah, we're still climbing is if, if those two things happen, you know, I think that we can still say it was a pretty good season. So we'll see what happens, you know, here over the next couple of weeks, we're going to learn a lot uh, starting of course with uh, Albany coming up this Saturday. Um, you guys can be on the lookout for our Albany preview release in middle of this week, most likely Wednesday or Thursday. Um, definitely um, going to be a fun one to talk about. Uh, West Virginia, you know, good good record against the FCS teams. Hopefully we'll be able to kick, keep that going, and hopefully they'll be able to take out, you know, some of these hard feelings they're having after this Penn State loss on that Albany team. But before we get there, we got to wrap this one up, guys. Uh, any final thoughts before we do that? Uh, the only thing I'll say is my final thought is to your sentiment that, that you just said about the – getting in the top 25. I don't care about getting in the top 25 at all this year. I want to finish in the top 25. Yeah, it's even I better. I want this team even better. That's, that, that will be – that I'll say more than more than a, accumulating as much as eight wins to me equals success. If you can finish this season in the top 25, I'll consider that a success. I like that. That's a good point. Even better. Even better for sure. Brad, any final thoughts? If this team is who we think they are, Albany's the last team I'd want to be on Saturday. <laughs> no doubt, especially under the lights. I mean, they did it didn't do anything because we was under the daylight, but they was yeah, they was going they crazy with those lights, man. They the was lights. flashing blue and everything. Uh, so yeah, I, I think, can't wait uh, to see them. I think for I sure this Saturday there's going to be a bunch of epileptic people possibly having seizures. So don't go to the game if you're. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's gonna be uh if it's if the sun's down, you're gonna be seeing those lights do some crazy things. So uh should be fun to get to see it uh this this coming weekend against Albany, getting to see, you know, part of that game at least, you know, at night with the uh, six PM kickoff should be should be fun to see, you know. So get to Morgantown so you can check that out, guys. Stay behind this team as we said earlier. That's important. And another thing that's important to us is if you're watching here on YouTube, just hitting the little like button, giving us a thumbs up. That really helps a ton with the YouTube algorithm. If you listen on the audio side, you can find it on any podcast platform you like, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Apple Podcasts. Uh, leave us a rating, preferably a five-star rating. But, hey, give us what you think we deserve and share us around with other Mountaineer fans you may know and appreciate uh, WVSportsNow.com for hosting our episodes there as well. Having said that, for my co-host Steven and Bradley, as always, I'm Jordan Cruz, and until next time, let's go mountaining. If you really want to know, then come on, let's go. Take a stroll down those...